It was the summer of 1968. The country was troubled with an unpopular war in Vietnam, student uprisings, and the assassination of two prominent Americans. The Me Too movement was just beginning with angry women threatening to burn their bras in public to protest, and hippies were crowding the street corners. I finished my second space flight, Gemini 12, in November 1966. I was looking forward to being involved in the Apollo program. I didn't pay any attention to what was happening outside NASA's gate. A disastrous fire in January 1967 on the Apollo 1 launch complex killed three friends and delayed Apollo for 10 months. Commitment to land on the moon by the end of the decade was in jeopardy. My next assignment was Apollo 8, an Earth orbital flight scheduled for December 1968 to check out the newly developed lunar module. My companions were Frank Borman and Bill Anders. I flew with Borman on Gemini 7. Anders was a rookie assigned to the lunar pilot position, and this mission would give him experience with the lunar module for a possible later lunar flight. Two incidents occurred in the summer of 68 that changed our mission and the history of Apollo. Grumman Aircraft Company, the maker of the lunar module, informed NASA that a lunar module would not be ready for delivery before 69. And suddenly, Apollo 8 did not have a mission. Next, we received intelligence from the Russians planning to launch a manned circumlunar flight in December 1968. They were serious. They flew the unmanned Zon 5 spacecraft around the moon in September, followed by Zon 6 in November. Zon 7 was being prepared for a manned flight in December. It was George Lowe, manager of the Apollo program, who had the brilliant idea. If Apollo 7's 10-day Earth orbit flight in mid-October to certify the Apollo Command Service Module, if it is successful, then launch Apollo 8's Command Service Module to the moon, not just to circumnavigate, but to go into lunar orbit. Lowe figured the flight would shorten the time to a lunar landing, would test the navigation and communication systems, check the effects of the moon's mass concentration on an orbiting spacecraft, look for suitable future landing areas, provide close-up photography, and finally, give America the uplift it needed. We had just four months to prepare for the flight. NASA management had to be convinced. The Saturn V booster still had problems. The navigation and communication systems needed upgrading, and Apollo 7 had to be successful. De Borman, the change in the mission, answered his dream to beat the Russians to the moon. He had no interest in exploration. Anders, at first, was disappointed not to test the lunar module, a step towards a lunar landing flight. I was delighted. To me, this would be a mini Lewis and Clark expedition, exploring new territory on the moon's far side. It all came together on the early morning of December 21st, 1968. Crossing the bridge from the launch tower to the spacecraft, I saw 360 feet below the lights of the press vehicles driving into the press site. Suddenly, I realized I'm actually going to the moon. All that navigational training I had was for real. At 721, Apollo 8 
started its journey. There had been no sign of a Russian launch. Our third stage booster put us on a long elliptical orbit with its apogee intercepting the moon in three days. We entered lunar orbit on the dark side, the moon nowhere to be seen. As we continued to orbit, shards of sunlight started to illuminate the peaks of craters just 60 miles below. Finally, the far side was bathed in sunlight, and we stared in silence as the ancient far side craters slowly passed underneath. I was observing, I was observing alive that part of the moon that had been hidden from man for millions of years. Then looking up, I saw it, the Earth, a blue and white ball just above the lunar horizon, 240,000 miles away. I thought, my world is only as far as the eye can see. In the country, mountains, hills, or grove of trees can restrict my world. In cities, tall buildings define my world. And in this cathedral, my world exists within these walls. But seeing the Earth at 240,000 miles, my world suddenly expanded to infinity. I put my thumb up to the window and completely hid the Earth. Just think, over three billion people, mountains, oceans, deserts, everything I ever knew was behind my thumb. As I observed the Earth, I realized my home was a small planet, one of nine in the solar system, it is just a mere speck in our Milky Way galaxy and lost to oblivion in the universe. I began to question my own existence. How do I fit in to what I see? And then I remembered a saying I'd often heard, I hope to go to heaven when I die. I suddenly realized that I went to heaven when I was born. I arrived on a planet with a proper mass to have the gravity to contain water and an atmosphere, the essentials for life. I arrived on a planet orbiting a star at just the right distance to absorb that star's energy, energy that caused life to evolve in the beginning. In my mind, the answer was clear. God gave mankind a stage upon which to perform. How the play ends is up to us. Apollo 8 slowly over to the, to the familiar near side and friendly landmarks came into view. First was the clear crater Langrenus with its terraced walls the Mercier and the Sea of Fertility. Ahead, I could see the Sechi mountain range winding its way down to the Sea of Tranquility. On Tranquility's shore, I found Mount Maryland, a small triangular mountain that would soon be the stepping stone for the first lunar landing. By all means, the flight of Apollo 8 was a complete success. All spacecraft systems functioned as planned. Navigation and communication operations proved their worth. The timing of the flight, orbiting the moon at Christmas, provided a spiritual environment to read the first 10 verses of Genesis to an audience on Earth. Borman got his wish to beat the Russians to the moon. Anders became a celebrity for his famous Earthrise photo, and that one photo provided convincing evidence 
that many nations are but one world. As for me, the flight prepared me for my next lunar mission, Apollo 13, but that's another story. It was the American public, however, that received the greatest gift. After a year of controversy, Apollo 8 gave them a reason to be American. The flight of Apollo 8 can best be expressed by a telegram received by the crew. It only said, thanks, you saved 1968. The following July, I was asked to escort Charles Lindbergh to watch the launch of Apollo 11. As we listened to the countdown, I said to him, take a look at that Saturn V rocket. The spacecraft on top will try to land on the moon. But I could tell he was in deep thought, his mind elsewhere. I suspect that he was thinking of his own voyage, that perilous 34-hour overwater flight from New York to Paris. Suddenly he answered, Apollo 11 will be quite an accomplishment. But your flight, Apollo 8, that initial 240,000-mile voyage from the Earth to the moon, that's the flight I will remember.